Well, good morning, Berean. Glad you've joined us wherever you are that you've joined us. I uh, want to make a couple of comments before we look to Scripture. And uh, while I can't see you in your home or wherever it is that you've joined us this morning, I want you to know that you are in our hearts and our mind. And so when I turn and I turn to sections that currently are pretty much empty, uh, except for some of the team that's here, just I am picturing you and imagining you. And if you want to join in, when I look at your section, you know where you sit. Uh, You can just wave back at the screen, the digital device that you're on. Because I'm thinking about you, we're thinking about you, we're praying for you, looking forward to the time that we get back together. Second, I do want to correct something I said last week. I hate to say something that's not true and leave it uncorrected. And my wife pointed out that my sermon last week was not entirely accurate. So I want to correct an inaccuracy. Um, I said when I talked about being a youth pastor that I have as much hair now as I did then, and she said, no, you don't. (laughs) That is not true. Look at the back of your head in the mirror. Well, that's hard for me to do, but in my memory, I'm as young as I was then, even though um, reality doesn't settle in that way. So I wanted to fix that and uh, make that correction. We've been talking about the power of the resurrection. We started on Resurrection Sunday, recognizing that our entire faith rests on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That without the resurrection, our faith is vain, it's empty, and it's meaningless. Our faith is unique on that very simple point that Jesus died, rose from the dead, ascended to the Father on our behalf, and that's where we put our faith and confidence. But when you believe that, when you believe that Jesus died and rose for you, then with that come some challenges that are portrayed for us in Matthew chapter 28. And last week we talked about the first challenge of that and that was to fear not, don't be afraid, do not be afraid. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in the Lord and I will trust in the Lord and not be afraid. And in a culture that is woven with fear right now, in fact, that's one of the signs of the end that men's heart will begin failing them for fear and we don't have to live there. The second challenge from the angel was to come and see. The angel did not say to the women, come and learn, but come and see. Now, we do need to learn truth, but what I want to drive home and the basis for the video that you just watched is that our faith is not just intellectual, it's not just emotional, it's not just volitional, but our faith is experiential. We experience it as we learn. We experience it as we feel. We experience it in the choices that we make. And we're not just joining a club, we're not just um, agreeing with a doctrine, but Christianity is more than praying a prayer. It's inviting Jesus into your life and experiencing him. It's not just read a book and learn, it's come see. And I want us to understand the experiential dynamic of what that means. So as you're watching today, the gospel wasn't intended to be observed, it was intended to be participated in. So (laughs) right where you sit, say amen, raise a hand, say thank you Jesus, hallelujah. Because this doesn't work if we don't participate. It is experiential at the core. And it's that challenge that we have to carry. Once you have fear moved out of the way and the cloudiness has gone from your eyes and you're not blinded by what you're afraid of, then the angel says, come in and see what the truth of resurrection power is. So we're gonna take that phrase, come and see, and trace it through scripture. So. This will not be an exhaustive message, though it might be exhausting. It won't cover everything that Scripture has to say that we need to experience, but we're going to use that phrase, come and see, and look at where people were challenged to experience truth rather than just simply be in a place where they are um, understanding or learning truth. And the first one is right here in the text, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 6. We need to experience the evidence of his resurrection. What do we need to experience? We need to experience the evidence of his 
resurrection. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew 28, verse 6. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. The angel could have stopped there and said, now believe that and go on your way. Or I have a track that God has written for you to read and learn from. But instead, he said, he is not here. He has risen just as he said, listen, come and see the place. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Come in here. Come into the sepulcher. Walk in here and see with your own eyes. Touch it if you want to. See the place where the Lord lay. He's gone. Experience it. Carry that evidence with you. There is evidence that he has risen from the dead. See where he used to be. So the issue is experiencing the evidence of resurrection life. The reality of the resurrection is more. I just, I'm feeling it burning on the inside of me. And if I could somehow drive that home to you, I would say it this way. We need to experience, not just learn about or read a book. It's got to be experiential. It's got to get on the inside of us. That the evidence of the resurrection is what we've experienced, not something we have simply read about or put our minds toward. The reality of the resurrection is more than mental ascent. It's experiential. Here's how John captures it in his first epistle. Listen to what John had to say in his first epistle. That which was from the beginning, what is that? He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal nature of Jesus. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. What is he saying? I'm not telling you something I read about. I'm not telling you something I've simply come to believe. I'm not telling you something that I, that I think is something good for you to also enter into and we'll sign a covenant agreement. I'm gonna tell you, listen, I'm gonna tell you what I've seen. I'm gonna tell you what I've heard and I'm gonna tell you what my hands have handled. What is that? That is the evidence of the resurrection, evidence of resurrection truth. We experience that. What evidence then have you experienced? Now, if you were all here, I'd walk over here and I'd point someone out and I'd point someone out here and I'd point someone out and I'd look you right in the eye. So pretend I am right now when I come to your section, get nervous because I'm gonna call you out. What evidence of the resurrection have you experienced? If I were to say to you, now what have you read? Now what great teacher have you heard? But what resurrection power have you experienced? What have you got your hands a hold of? You see, it's not enough to pray a prayer. It's not enough to pray a sinner's prayer, as important as that is. You've got to experience the power of new life in Christ, resurrection power. I can tell you what I know. What's the evidence I've experienced? I once was dead, but now I'm alive. Is there anyone hearing me? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. What story could you tell? I can tell stories of when Jesus came by and healed my family. I can tell you times of when Jesus came by and touched me and gave me a physical healing. I can tell you when I have prayed for others and they've been healed. I can say to you, come see where there once was death, the empty tomb. And now come and look and see where there is life. Where there once was death, there now is life. It is experiential. It needs to be part of the fabric of our being. That we, have, that we have evidence in our own life. What have you experienced? What story can you tell? Bring that up and get that ready to share with someone else. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Second, we need to experience the reality of his goodness. The reality of his goodness. Listen to this in John chapter one. I love this story. This probably, this probably should be a series. I should probably start over and preach one of these every week, but I'm gonna to try to get it into one message. The reality of his goodness. Nathaniel said to him, who to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Philip said, come and see. What's happening? What's happening in this story? Nathaniel and Philip are having a discussion about the Messiah. Philip believes that they have found the Messiah. 
Nathaniel asked about that, about that, and he says, well, he comes from Nazareth. And, and uh, Nathaniel says, well, how can he come from Nazareth? There are other prophecies, ignoring the one that says he will be called a Nazarene. That's ignored in his mind, but he's saying, how in the world could a, a, a Messiah, the leader, the ruler that should come, come from Nazareth? And, and Philip knows that if he gives an intellectual argument, it's not gonna change his heart. How many of you know And you at home, how many of you know that when you have an intellectual argument, it doesn't change the heart of an individual? Philip doesn't say, let me give you all the reasons. I was reading Isaiah, I was reading Ezekiel, I was reading in Daniel, I had this prophetic revelation. He doesn't say any of that. He simply says what all of us should say to people who've not yet met Jesus, come and see. You don't think there's any good that can come out of Nazareth? Well then, come and see, experience for yourself so Nathaniel says right I will so what does Nathaniel experience when (laughs) when Nathaniel walks up to Jesus he doesn't listen to what he doesn't get he doesn't get a rebuke he doesn't get a correction he doesn't get challenged because of his lack of faith or his unwillingness to believe He sees Nathanael coming to him and he says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. What is he saying to Nathanael? He's saying, Nathanael, I know you. You're not like the Pharisees. You're not like the Jews who are playing religion. You are what the Old Testament describes as a true son of Abraham. I can see faith in you. I can see passion in you. I see authenticity in you. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. You're not a liar. You're not a pretender. I see who you are. And Nathaniel's unimpressed. He thinks he's been confronted by a flatterer. How many of you have ever been complicated, complicated, complimented in a complicated way? complimented by someone someone that didn't mean it you know they're just a flatterer I I get really nervous when people have to come up to me and tell me just how spiritual they are and then tell me how spiritual I am over the years I've had people say pastor I just I love your teaching I I love your ministry I want to sit at your feet I want to learn from you and I know that's not going to last because as soon as we disagree (laughs) they're going to go the other direction and so Nathaniel looks at Jesus and says how do you know me How do you know me? We've never met. It's the, now watch, it's the first time that Nathaniel has seen Jesus, but it's the second time Jesus has seen Nathaniel. It's the second time. How do you know me? And Jesus says, Nathaniel, before Philip called you, While you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now here's what you have to understand. It's a whole long background to the story. But the fig tree was a common place for Jews to go for their devotional time, waiting on God. And based on the context and other evidence that I don't have time to present, but I can defend, I'm absolutely convinced that Nathaniel was sitting under the fig tree asking asking his father, God asking the God of Abraham, when will the Messiah come? Who is the Messiah? When will this come to pass? He might have been reading in Isaiah or Daniel or Ezekiel somewhere pondering that because when Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I saw you. What an incredible moment for Jesus and Nathanael. And then Jesus makes this prophetic declaration to Nathanael. Do you believe because I said I saw you under the fig tree? Here's where we're going, Nathanael. Grab hold of this one. After this, you're going to see the heavens open. And you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Do you know what just happened there? In a matter of moments, Jesus took Nathaniel from a mocker, scoffer, skeptic, and moved him into a place that says, you're going to see divine revelation in front of your eyes because I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah and moved him to a place of faith. 
Why? How did that happen? Because Jesus let him see God's goodness. Remember the challenge that Philip gave to Nathaniel. Anything good come out of Nazareth? Why don't you come and see? So he comes to see Jesus, and Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus affirms what is best in Nathaniel. Jesus demonstrates supernatural revelation about Nathaniel, and Jesus makes a prophetic declaration to Nathaniel. What is God's goodness? Here's what I know for sure. When you come to him, listen, God's first intent, Jesus' first response to you isn't going to be to point out how wrong you are, where you've made mistakes, where you failed. He's going to talk about what he sees in you that's good. He's going to see in you what you can be, the potential that you have when you put your life and faith in Jesus Christ and begin to build you up. It is the goodness of God that leads men and women to repentance. It's the goodness of God that is life-changing for all of us. And so I'm declaring to you this morning that what this world needs to see when they say that Jesus isn't real or they mock the church or they make fun of Christianity for us to simply say, you need to see the goodness of God. Come with me and let's see if anything good can come out of Nazareth. Where's the world going to see that today? Where are they going to see the goodness of God today? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill, listen to this, all the good pleasure of his goodness. My prayer is that you will fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. God is good, God is virtuous, God is kind, he's perfect, he builds up, he purifies, he perfects. And where is the world gonna see that? They're gonna see that in you and in me, the goodness of God revealed in us. How important is that? It's a story that I've told many, many times, and uh, I want to tell it again because of the impact that it's had on me. Carol and I went to Bible college with a young lady who was of mixed ethnicity. Her mother was Japanese. Her father was American, I believe, or vice versa. She was half American, half Japanese. And she went back to Japan as a missionary. She was teaching in the university. And after one of her classes, one of the young women came up to her and said, I believe that God is good because you are good. And she said, no, 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 no. If there's any goodness in me, it's because it comes from God. It comes from him. I'm good. If I'm good at all, I'm good because God is good. And the student said, no, you don't understand. Because you believe in God and you are good, I believe that God is good. That's the impact that we need to have on the world around us. They need to see you, they need to see us manifesting the goodness of God, seeing how that has changed us and motivated us and moved us in the places that God wants us to go that you can say, <laughs> I know this sounds really arrogant and uh, keep those cards and letters coming, uh, but I, I know it's gonna sound really arrogant, but to say, do you wanna see the goodness of God? I'm an open book. I'm an open book. Let me show you. Not let me tell you. Not let me give you an academic treatise or a, a theological argument. Let me show you the goodness of God. This is what I was. This is what I am. Here's how he's changed me. He's made me new. He's made me new. We need to see. The world needs to see. We need to experience, not read about. We need to experience the reality of the goodness of God. Number three. What else do we need to see? We need to see the evidence of his resurrection. We need to see the reality of his goodness. And then we need to see the impact of his grace. John chapter four. Oh, <laughs> a woman at the well. A woman that other women would not associate with is getting water at noon. Jesus interacts with her. 
Then she goes back to the city, and here's what she says in John chapter 4, verse 29. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And the city came out to hear her. Now, there's a part of me that chuckles at that because this was an immoral woman. When Jesus asks her to go get her husband, she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus prophetically declares to her, that is true. You don't have a husband. You've had five, and the one you're with now, you're not married to. Her heart gets smitten by that interaction. Now, that was unusual, very unusual in, in, in that day to have that many husbands live that kind of lifestyle. The women of the town rejected her. And I'm just suspicious that when she, <laughs> when she said, come see a man that told me everything I've ever done, she didn't do those on her own. She did those with somebody. And I imagine there are a few that came out and wanted to know, what is she going to tell? They gather around, they listen to her story. And their hearts are prepared to hear what Jesus has to say. In spite of her immoral lifestyle, he offers her newness of life. And, and they get in this whole debate. <laughs> they get in this whole debate about water and drinking water in a well. And are you greater than our father? Let me put this in my paraphrase. This is extended uh, paraphrase plus commentary. They, they quit talking about water a long time before the word water goes away. Jesus confronts her and he, and he says, sorry if this offends you, but he says to her, you've been looking for love in all the wrong places. You've been looking for love in all the wrong places. What is driving a woman that is with five men, can't live with them, living with a sixth one, what drives her? A thirst that isn't being satisfied. What causes people to pursue immorality? A thirst that isn't being satisfied. What causes people to pursue drugs and alcohol? A thirst that isn't being satisfied. What causes people to pursue money and fame and climbing the corporate ladder with greed and avarice and willing to cut people off? It's a thirst that isn't satisfying them. And Jesus says, you've been to well after well after well and you've not ever been satisfied, but I've got good news for you. I have a well of water that will spring up to everlasting life and you will never thirst again when you've been running from well to well to well and you can't find water that satisfies Jesus says I have something for you to drink they listen to her and they know she's a different woman that's not the woman that was an outcast that's not the woman that's marked by sin. That's not the woman with the big red A for adultery on her forehead. She is saying this impact of his grace changed my life. It made me new. The grace of Jesus Christ changed everything about her. This grace is experiential. And I get involved, I love theology, I love studying what scripture has to say and how we handle that, but I'm telling you that all the studies in all the world about grace won't satisfy your thirst for something that satisfies. There is only one thing that will, and that isn't learning about his grace, it's about experiencing his grace in a way that changes you. Experiential grace, come and see. Come see a man that told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? And they received him. When Jesus came to the city, they said, now we believe not because of her testimony, but because we have seen you. We know what you can do. Grace is something we walk in. It's not just something that we experience the grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, somehow, if you could share this with a thirsty world that's striving after something to satisfy, 
There is a well. I'm telling you, there is a well. There is a well that satisfies that people will never thirst again, but they're never going to come to the well until they see that we've had a drink from that well and that we have had our thirst quenched. Grace is not something you study about. It's something you walk in. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 says it this way, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So the discussion we need to have is not have you received grace, it's are you experiencing grace? Are you walking in it now that it is satisfying your thirst? It changes who you are. Do we understand the impact of his grace? Now this last one is gonna take a little bit different turn but I hope it'll help someone. Fourth is we need to experience the signs of his return. The signs of his return. Now stay with me for a minute. Revelation chapter six, I'm gonna read verses one, three, five, and seven. Now I saw the lamb open one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, what did he say? He said, come and see. Verse three. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying what? Come and see. Verse five, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. And then verse seven, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth creature say, come and see. With the onset of coronavirus, I don't think I've heard as much talk about end time prophecy since Y2K. Hold your hand up right where you're sitting if you know where Y2K, what Y2K is, what that was even about. It was going to be the end of the world. I remember we did a watch. What's interesting to me in Revelation chapter 6, there is a seven sealed book. And the seven sealed book wasn't about reading information says to John, come and see, experience it. Pastor, do you think we're living in the last days? Yeah, I do. Here's why I believe that. Because in Acts chapter two, Peter quoted Joel and said, in the last days saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That happened on the day of Pentecost, and from that day till this, we've been in the last days. So in this time of trouble, here's what I want you to grab hold of. When prophecy begins to make you nervous and people are proclaiming all kinds of things that will cause you to get off track, and what about this, and what does this mean, and what is going to happen when this happens? Prophecy is to be experienced, not understood intellectually through studious means. What do you mean by that? Watch and be ready. When those things begin to unfold on the earth, there'll be a revelation of God similar to what John had that the Spirit of God will say to you, come and see. So church, I'm calling you in this time of chaos to calm down, to settle down, put your confidence in God, believe that he has it in control and watch supernatural events unfold that they'll be revealed by the Spirit of God when we need to know them, not by somebody preaching on a street corner somewhere. Say amen, somebody, and help me out today. Come and see. I watch with interest. I study with purpose. I pray with a request for discernment and I spend time in the word of God because I want to experience prophecy. You know what I'm looking forward to experience? Experiencing the day when there's a shout from heaven, the sound of a trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air with them and to, uh, and in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with 
the Lord. Don't let the signs and times and seasons put you in a place of chaos. Just say, Jesus, when it's time, I know you'll say, come and see and you'll bring revelation to your church and your church will be ready to move forward in the pathways that you have for us. This work of faith, this thing we call Christianity, the challenge of the resurrection, is one that calls us to experiential faith. It's one that says we need to experience the evidence of the resurrection. We need to experience the reality of his goodness. We need to experience the impact of his grace, and we need to experience the signs of his return. The word of God is the same to you and me today. Come and see, come and see. So today, this morning, I often say on a Sunday, I don't know where you are in your walk with God. I don't know that about anybody. And I can surely say that today because I can't even see you. But I can tell you this, wherever you are, the most important thing that I could ever offer you is not a church to join or a prayer to pray but say to you, come see a man. Come see a man who will change everything about your life. And it's this simple. How do I do that? Pastor, how do I begin this journey? How does it start? It starts this simply, to admit your need of a savior. To admit your need. I've failed, I've sinned, I've failed you in so many ways. Then second, to believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead. That's what you have to believe. Admit your need and believe that he provided for you. And then what? Confess him as Lord because whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So right now, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, would you pray that in some way? With your own words, admit your need. Let him know you believe in him as Savior. Confess him as your Lord. And then will you let us know so we can walk alongside you? You can comment here as you're watching online. You can go to the website and let us know. We'd love to come alongside you. But for the rest of us, I think for there to be the revival that God wants to bring, for there to be a move when this part of the journey is over, If there's anything that we need to be sure about today, it's that we have more than a head faith. We have a heart faith. That we've moved our faith from an intellectual understanding to an experiential reality. So right where you are, right in your living room, in your vehicle, out in the yard, I don't know, wherever you might be, Whatever section you might normally sit in here at Berean, right now, would you take a moment to experience his love?